Brittany, more than 50 people have shown up here today to protest last month's shooting of 17-year-old Christiana Coignard. Many are questioning actions police took moments before those fatal shots were fired. This entire area was blocked off to the public until the next business day while police investigated the fatal shooting of that 17-year-old girl. When the surveillance video was first released, police chief Don Dingler said officers responded based on how they were trained. The protesters here today said they should reevaluate their protocol. It was a great game tonight at Pirate Stadium between the Dragons and the Mavericks. Unfortunately for the Dragons, they couldn't turn this one out. It was a good run, though. Let's have a look at some highlights from earlier. The Russ County Sheriff's Department says they have seen ATM burglaries in the past, but for the store owner of the Clayton Shell Station, this is uncharted territory. Surveillance shows two suspects backed up the truck of an 18-wheeler into the Clayton Shell Station around 2 Tuesday morning. The pair is shown chaining up an ATM and making off with it. The Sheriff's Department says this case is still under investigation, but have been able to piece together some evidence after recovering both the ATM and the vehicle about a mile and a half away from the scene. Investigators say they believe this burglary was planned out and the truck was stolen out of Harrison County. Jeff Price has been sheriff of Russ County for two years and says even though this is an unusual case, he has seen ATM robberies before. We've had these before, back when I was working for the PD, and we've had them happen since I've been sheriff where we've had ATM stolen. However, for store owner Jackie Clayton, this is a first. The 18-wheeler damaged the granite island in the center of the entrance and broke the water line, ultimately flooding the store. Clayton says everything should be repaired within a few days, and now it is business as usual, almost. It's been fun. Uh, people have come in, and they all feel sorry for us, and, you know, we said it hadn't happened, but, you know, life goes on. We'll, we'll do the best we can, and uh, we opened at 530, and uh, we were sweeping water for, for over three hours to, to dry the place out. At this time, investigators are unsure how much money was in the cash machine. Anyone with any information is asked to call the Russ County Sheriff's Department. Reporting live in the Longview Newsroom, Valerie Kilgore, KETK News. Brittany, more than 50 people have shown up here today to protest last month's shooting of 17-year-old Christiana Coignard. Many are questioning actions police took moments before those fatal shots were fired. Many say there had to be another way without using lethal force. When the surveillance video was first released, police chief Don Dingler said officers responded based on how they were trained. The protesters here today said they should reevaluate their protocol. Uh, there's got to be some type of training for uh, mental illness, depression, bipolar. I mean, uh, if you saw the surveillance tape, it's pretty clear that they had multiple opportunities to uh, restrain her. They should be trained better than trying to shoot somebody who's just wagging a knife. Um, they could have shot at the legs, the feet, whatever, or could have just, you know, three policemen could have just overwhelmed her, but they should not have shot her. The video shows a physical struggle that lasts several minutes when police say it became apparent the teen had a knife. Protesters say the officer should have handcuffed Coignard then. Arrest! Don't shoot! Arrest! Don't shoot! They slammed her to the ground and... They let, her, they let her have like too many chances and then they shot her and they could have just handcuffed her while she was on the ground. A candlelight vigil was held at 530 to remember the teen who battled mental illness and to say a prayer for peace. Mara says she battles mental illness much like Coignard so it was important for her to attend this vigil. It's all about respect. This protest might seem heated and they were saying that we were getting violent. We weren't. Um, but. Even the protest is about respect, and this vigil respects her memory. A press release was sent out Friday saying Coignard's family has hired attorney Tim Maloney to evaluate available legal options. In a statement, the police department says their thoughts and prayers are with Coignard's family. As you can see with the decorations behind me, the police department still has a strong backing in the community. We will continue to follow this story and our coverage will be on our website at KETKNBC.com. This was actually the Dragons' second consecutive year in the playoffs, which hasn't happened to them since 1966. The Dragons brought the ball down to the 10-yard line and were able to bring the first touchdown within minutes of the game starting. They got the field goal, of course, and the score was 7-0 Dragons. Maverick Cameron Holler received the ball, was brought down instantly by Corey Lane. Justin Hart carried the ball a few more yards for the Mavericks before being taken down by Kyle Kenrick. Number 33, Chavez Mills, made a swift getaway and gave the Mavericks their first touchdown. It was a tied game. 
Hunter McClellan makes a beautiful pass to Tay Thomas, who instantly gets taken down by Brandon Jernigan. Here you can see Ken Rogers stopped by Maverick Trell Patton. And the final score of the game was 67-42 for the Mavericks. The Dragons are going home for the rest of the season. The Mavericks will face off against Oak Cliff next week in Tyler. That's it for me in Longview. I'm Valerie Kilgore. Danny, back to you. Dale and Casey, this effort gives foster students the chance to go to prom. Pine Tree ISD and CPS are reaching out to the community for everything it takes to make this an extra special night. Prom is one of those milestones that is remembered forever. For a variety of reasons, some teenagers don't get that opportunity. Pine Tree ISD teacher JoLynn McKnight says the district has worked with Child Protective Services since 2008 to collect donations and to host a prom for foster teenagers. There were students who it was our understanding that were not able to go to their normal prom or may not have access to clothing or things that they needed to be able to, to go. And so this was to try to help them. How could we step up and try to help them in any way to have a lifestyle that they are very deserving of? Colette Steck works for Child Protective Services and says they are expecting about 100 participants at this year's prom. Among the items needed are men and women's formal wear and, of course, makeup, dress shoes, and accessories to make the makeover complete. Prior to the prom events, we will be getting the young women all glamorized, and that includes having hair done, makeup, and getting to pick out two dresses, one to wear to the event and then one to take home. Donations can be made to any Pine Tree ISD campus until March 7th. Steck says this is a great opportunity to give back to the community. These gifts are given to our young men and women who are a part of the community. Even though they're foster youth, they're our youths. More information about this event can be found on our website at KETKNBC.com. Decades ago, Dansby Village had a school, hotels, and other businesses. The head of the restoration project, Lamont Wheat, grew up in this neighborhood and says a number of transitions led to a loss of resources and businesses to relocate. A lot of resources were taken out because, you know, the school was desegregated and so a lot of the faculty left the community. Um, and then in the 80s, it was impacted by drugs. Crack cocaine was a really big pandemic in the community that really uh, met its demise. A lot of the buildings that you uh, would have experienced were pushed down. This intersection, for example, had hotels and motels. There is none here now. One last business still stands today, the West Side Barbershop. The owner, Alvin Mayfield, has seen a number of changes in his 55 years here, but says it's still a good community and the efforts of the restoration project are worthwhile. We've just come a long, long way and even though things have changed, I still think we can can still be productive. So far, the project has improved roadways in order to facilitate a 5K fundraiser next month. Proceeds will go to changes that residents will be able to see right away. Our intent is to restore the signage in Dansby Village. Um, the signs have been falling apart for the last few years and so we wanted to do something quick and simple that the residents can see quick improvement and we also want to work with the city to, to define other projects that we can do together. Wheat says these efforts are intended to unite the community to get more involvement in the revitalization of this historical neighborhood.